Well, welcome. Good morning and welcome to Christ Fellowship Church Prayer Ministry Training Class. We welcome you to be with us this morning. This is our 14th and final class of this series. This is the third class about deliverance. So, so we're talking about deliverance today. We're going to be talking about deliverance or freedom in Christ, our freedom that we already have. Well, let's pray as we begin. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We acknowledge your presence here with us as teacher. Lord, that you would, um, we pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding. Lord, to bring us closer to you and to your, in, into your promises. Lord, for us to see, Lord, what you have done. Lord, the, the provision that you've made for your people and your will concerning our freedom, Lord, in every area of our life. And we thank you for that. Father, I pray that you would speak to these precious brothers and sisters of mine. Lord, bring them clarity. Lord, help them to see uh, further today, uh, gaining wisdom and confidence, Lord, to not only to minister this gift, Lord, that you've provided, Father, but be able to explain, Lord, to impart word and, and understanding to others who might be confused. Father, these will be equipped, Lord, to truly, truly minister your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to begin by saying um, a great big thank you and appreciation to our production and broadcast team. Yes. These folks, and there's a lot of people, we always have two of them with us in class, but there are a lot of people in our uh, control room right now who are working, busy working, making sure that this class is visually appealing out on uh, the internet and also for viewing in the future. And uh, it takes a lot to do that, to make it effective. Also, I want to thank our translation team. They're in the background. We never see them, but they're always um, working and um, having such a huge effect. This class is the first class that um, has been translated, and it's just so important that that has taken place. I also want to thank our children's team. They are here early with us every Sunday morning taking care of your babies uh, so that you can be in class. And also our worship team who changed their schedule. They're here all the time anyway, but they changed their schedule to accommodate us being in the classroom so that we could have a nice atmosphere that's just that's free of distraction, those kinds of things. So a lot of people have sacrificed a lot to be here, and including you all. So thank you so much for your uh, attentiveness and your commitment to learn. Um, so just getting back to our material a little bit, um, as I emphasized in my introductory comments a few weeks ago, our study for this class particularly is, is built around an altar setting, altar ministry setting in the church, in a church setting. Uh, as you recall, I mentioned that we would be ministering in full view of the congregation and now in full view of the public oftentimes. So um, for this last class, I'm, I'm focusing only on prayer ministry scenarios that would, in, that would occur in a church setting, in a sanctuary church setting. There's a, a lot of different directions that we can go when we talk about deliverance because it's a huge subject. But for this last, our final class, I'm only going to focus on what we would expect in a church setting, how we would respond in a church setting. However... Uh, in your manual, we've provided resource material as an introduction to ministry in situations where someone is exhibiting a manifestation that is violent or would in some way uh, cause confusion or disruption in a service. Uh, we have a protocol in place for in-house ministry that those people must follow. Okay, we're very careful about that. Um, you'll find that information in your manual. You might just look at it real quick on pages 63 through 66. 63 through 66, I'm not gonna go into it in any detail, but just to point out that that's where you find how those 
teams minister in those settings, okay? You just be familiar with that. Be sure and note the cleansing prayer provided for the prayer minister on page 66. You want to be aware that that is there. Also, we've included additional definitions and scriptures about the demonic on pages 67 through 70 and 72 and 73. Now, I've already mentioned most of these details in my class presentation, but I want you to know where that information is so you can refer back to it if you want to. I won't touch on it again today. Today, again, we're gonna focus uh, our study on actual one-on-one -on -one ministry and follow-up, some follow-up uh, points that you can keep in mind to um, kind of tie a knot in the end of your ministry session. As you'll recall, our basic defining factor with regard to determining whether or not deliverance is needed is when a person exhibits the inability to be free from mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual bondage associated with works of the flesh or demonic activity. I mentioned before that we need to be aware of and, and listening for and being able to uh, note and determine what the obstacle is that's dominating them, that's got them tied up, so to speak. So whether the problem's rooted in the works of the flesh, something like self-pity, that can be big, that can be major in someone's life, uh, dominating them, self-pity, uh, which would be a works of the flesh or a realm that the enemy's working through. You'll remember I've concluded our last class talking about the four basic realms that we listen for when we're in a conversation with someone so that we will know how to, how to respond in prayer accurately and effectively. And those four basic realms, you remember, spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental. Those were the four realms that I've talked about and the clues that we can look for to determine how to identify the antidote or the solution that's all, that was provided uh, in the scriptures. You'll remember that I've said over and over and over that we must pray for discernment. That's part of our preparation is, is that we are prayed up always. That is key. You'll remember our formula, all of the Lord and all of me yielded to him. And so that's kind of the second part there. As you practice being yielded to Father on purpose, this is a choice that you're making in advance to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide you through making these determinations, seeing what that obstacle is and seeing that path to get that obstacle out of the way, out of that person's life. Now, not only do we need to know what realm the problem in, is in, but whether or not a demonic force is present in some way. Okay, so that's... That's key. I talked a lot about realms and all this kind of thing, but everyone wants to know, how do I know if there's something demonic that's, that's, that's working in that person's life? That, that's what's tying them up. So the main defining factor as to whether or not the demonic involved is manifestation. Okay, go with me to page 74 in your manual real quick. Manifestation. And I've already covered the top section in my dialogue, but let's start at the bottom. All believers can and should experience some level of discernment. It's simply an inner knowing that something's not right when the demonic is present, okay? Also, if we can't rely on that, we can simply rely on observation. You see that manifestation is right there in front of you. You see that activity that's going on. Here's our example, Matthew 15, 22. The woman of Canaan came to Jesus with an appeal that he cast out an unclean spirit from her daughter. She said to him, my daughter is severely demon possessed or demonized. How did she know this? She knew it by having observed the symptoms seen in her daughter. Demonic detection is simply observing what demonic spirits do to a person, and we call that manifestation. Okay, so that'll help you there to be able to recognize that. So again, the main defining factor as to whether or not the demonic is involved is manifestation. You'll know when to address the demonic. Otherwise, we're gonna pray for them, we're gonna lead them in some powerful word-based prayers just like we have in all of the other situations we've studied, okay? Prayers for those who are oppressed or um, 
need of deliverance, that they've lost their freedom in some way, or just like prayers for anything else. You identify the obstacle, you pull the promise in that Father's already given for that, that antidote, so to speak, that you pray into that situation. Everything tied to the promises and the benefits of our salvation, our covenant in Christ. Okay, so we're just always going back to our covenant that is, is immovable, is always fixed. It just, it remains, and we can always rely on that. Amen? All right, so let's go to page 60 in our manual. We're going to pick up here where we left off. And I would just still want to cover this section where it says pray for deliverance. These are just some general guidelines to keep in mind. Some of these points you already are familiar with by now because it's a consistent language that we use throughout our uh, material. But we want to focus on the specific problem or the demonic influence that has been identified. And you want to stay on track during your ministry session, okay? You're going to keep that in mind. I'm going to stay on track with this, this, this specifically so that you don't start somewhere and you get off over here when the problem's being identified, okay? It's very important. You want to stay on track to what you see happening. Of second paragraph there, of course, we do not have to beg or persuade God to deliver someone. We don't have to try to figure it out. Is it God's will? This is an easy one. He never wants his children to be bound up. He's a good father. And, and that's just a tiny reason why. I think the bigger one is that Jesus set the captive free. He came to set the captive free, and he paid a high price for our freedom. And so we're certainly going to know that that is uh, what already belongs to us, and Father's will is right there. He would never, ever want his children harassed or hindered, period. Uh, just like you wouldn't allow that for your children either. Um, although the power of God is sometimes present in a service in, in a special way for deliverance, everyone can pray because Jesus commanded us to do that the same way that he commanded us to spread the gospel, the very same way. Um, I'll point out Luke 10, 19 from your assurance first card. He said... Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So I'm, I am talking to you as the prayer minister, but you remember this when you're ministering to someone who's bound up because they have that same authority. Okay, so they're going to step into that same authority. It's already theirs. You're going to remind them of that authority, though. Okay, so that's just a a way to use your assurance verse there in a very powerful way, just to remind them that not only uh, is deliverance present for them, but they already have the authority over the enemy, any kind of wiles of the enemy that might be working in their life. So you just might remember to bring that in. In Matthew 12, 29, Jesus taught that you must first bind the enemy, then you can exercise power over him. And the word bind there, of course, is key. Lots of times it means take authority, it makes sense, it means forbid, oftentimes in scripture. It also means to tie up, to come in and tie up uh, someone or something. Here's the scripture. Now this scripture is sandwiched in between. We, we have to remember context if we're going to learn some things from our Lord, okay, because I don't think he misspoke anything, all right, but this scripture is sandwiched in between the Pharisees accusing him of casting out a demon by the power of Beelzebub. By, so that they're saying, you're demonic. That's the only way that you can cast a demon out, okay? Jesus responds with that he is not demonic, obviously, but he responds with this scripture. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, which is his house gear, is his house gear, except that he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. And he went on to say that a house divided cannot stand. A house divided against itself will not stand. It will fall. Uh, and that whoever is not with me is against me. So he was teaching in broad terms, but using this scripture here and, and helping us kind of have a glimpse into what happens in the spirit. But it's also telling us this is what he's already done. He has already done that. This, he's already taken the authority over the enemy. We know that. That's, that's, that's beginning 
of gospel. But let me read it to you in another translation because this is one of these scriptures that can just be mind-boggling. Where does all that fit in? Okay, but let, let me just read the New Living Translation to you. Let me illustrate this further. Who's powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Okay, so that's the key. Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. So tearing away all of his authority that he's come in and built in this earth realm and against humankind, against mankind, going in and plundering all that he's set up. So the Lord's gone before us and he's tied him up. Okay, so he has bound up that strong man, that key player in uh, the works of the darkness, okay? Does that make sense? Does that help you there? Get some clarity on that? That's sort of a hard uh, scripture to take in sometimes. All right, the next, the next paragraph. If demonic powers are binding through oppression from the outside, pray or command that their hold be loose and their powers be broken. I'm gonna show you an example. You've probably already read it. For example, Jesus loosed the woman in the synagogue from the spirit of infirmity. She was not possessed, but oppressed. The casting out of a demon was not necessary. So here we have it, Luke 13, 10 and thir through 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. Now that just captures me right there. He called her to him. So many people are reaching for him, but he called her to him. But I digress. All right, back to the scriptures. <laughs> I just love that. And he said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So he declared her freedom. He saw th that loosening that was going to happen. He declared it, laid his hands on her and the word that he spoke manifested right there in her. So there was no need to be um, have any kind of a deliverance session, as we call things now, but he just declared her freedom. The word clearly says that believers have the authority to cast demons out or command them to loosen their hold in the name of Jesus. We do not have that authority in and of ourselves. It's always the word of God and the name of Jesus that causes a person to be delivered, and we all know that. We always pray in the name of Jesus. On page 61, those ministering to the recipient should not yell or scream. It's our authority that causes the effect. Uh, and we've talked about that many times. But now there are some situations that I'll just say this, um, where it is, you need to be forceful to get that person's attention and to hold that person's attention, okay? But just don't, put your confidence in how loud you can get, because I can get loud, but may not have any effect. So we wanna make sure that we're not putting our hope in our flesh, okay, or what we can do, but in, that, um, in the name of Jesus and that we are his children and that we carry that authority, okay? I do wanna point out, of course, this is kind of a common sense thing, but I just like to say it out loud. Um, of course, demons understand human languages. No matter what dialect we speak in, they understand. The demonic understands human dialects. All of them, they understand. It's very key that when Father created and that first universal law, remember we talked about that, where he spoke. There was a lot of things that happened in that moment. I can't go into it. But, uh, and, and, not, and I don't understand all of it either, but a lot of things happened when, when Father chose to speak and it dispersed that through every realm. And so now the demonic are even able to, they are ancient, when we talk about they're ancient and numerous, but they are able to understand human dialect. So keep that in mind. They, they always try to confuse, so don't think they don't understand what you're saying, okay? And don't think that they don't recognize immediately the authority of the Christ of God, okay, and his name. They do, they do, but, but again, they will not hesitate to try to cause confusion or, or to cause you alarm, okay? They're, um, they're very skilled at that. 
part. Next thing, under no, no circumstance should we try to have a conversation with a demon. The Bible gives us our instructions here on how to um, take authority over the demonic forces. If a demonic force manifests through the recipient's spoken words, see here again, they are able to not only understand, but they're able to affect a person to, to speak. They're able to affect a person to speak. Okay, so um, just things to keep in mind. But we want to respond as Jesus did. We want to command them to be silent. Remember, any conversation with a demonic is dangerous because they're lying spirits. They seek to deceive you, and they will not hesitate. Remember, I talked before about how they are all in, okay? There's no mercy. Mercy does not exist. There's no grace. They are all in, and they are all in against you and against your children and against your friends. So we've got to stand firm in who we are. So we're going to command them to be silent and command them to leave in the name of Jesus. Um, people have maybe thought that, um, well, I've just had it said to me that Jesus spoke to Legion, that he had a conversation, and that maybe in other situations it appeared that there might have been a conversation. But what I mean by conversing is that don't start asking them questions about to kind of delve into that, okay? And I would, I suggest to you that Jesus interrogated Legion. He knew the answers. He was demonstrating for his disciples how to minister and his power and his authority, regardless of the uh, number of demons that were present and at work in that situation. So again, we just always um, just take authority and handle that situation. Also, just want to stop, just want to insert this while we're at this point, that unless, um, unless you're sure that you should, or unless the person brings it up first, we want to be careful about telling somebody, you're demonized. This is your problem. You're demonized. Well, I mean, you know, when somebody is, and they're bound up, and they they're already know something's wrong, well, that's going to just cause so much fear that they can't even focus on, on what you're saying. You know, a lot of times with people, and I've heard people say, all I could remember was that they said there was a demon in me. You know, and so they couldn't get any further. They're just locked down. So we, but we, of course, want to be honest and we want to show concern. So you might say the demonic is coming against you or the enemy is coming against you in your life. And that is true, okay? So I know it's just a matter of, of language here, but it's important because you want to be able to minister freedom. And if you if you frighten somebody unintentionally, but if we frighten somebody, you're not going to get very far. Okay, so we just want to keep that in mind. So we just um, just be careful with the language that we use. All right, and then so next, let's look back at our um, page 61 example of general prayer for deliverance, and we'll start there. So before I cover all these action items, I just want to say that in a deliverance, deliverance sec session with people, prayer ministry in this area, we have to stay fluid. In other words, we just need to follow the Spirit of God. Just be prayed up, be yielded so that, that it, you need to respond to what you see in front of you, okay? So I've got things one, two, three, four, five, six is what I mean, but not every time you won't minister that way every time. You just need to be familiar with these components of being effective to bring that freedom about, okay? So I just want to say that in, in advance so that you say, well, what was next? No, don't worry about that. Father's going to bring what that person needs, okay? But these are some components of what would happen in a church service, okay? So we always want to start by when somebody is bound up, when they have the inability to be free, because of something, we always want to start by speaking the truth over them. I beg your pardon, I want to stop one more time. Um, I've held on to this list for five years. And um, the reason is, it really spoke to me. This was um, 2017, because this, was, this is a sample of what we get in the altar services sometimes. I'm just going to read a few of the points to you. This was a young lady that brought this in and said, this is what I need you to help me with. So in essence, this is what she's, This is what you're going to encounter. This is what I need you to help me with. 
And so I want to read this to you, okay? It's very important. PTSD, porn addiction, prostitution, heart problems, raped in 2017, OCD, shame, fear, unworthy, bisexual, adultery, facing divorce, depression, forgotten sins, coming back to my memory, sickness, body weakness, infertility, so important what you all have done. I just commend you so much because this is a reality for so many people and this was just a young lady. This was a very young lady and this was her reality and she came knowing that the Lord had an answer for her and he was going to take care of all of this. Okay, all of this. And so that's what we're preparing for. Okay. It is a solemn thing to hear and to know that someone's actually living that way. But it's all around us. It's all around us now. And so we're preparing ourselves. You are preparing yourself to help people to start tearing down some of this. As I mentioned in the beginning of this section, that a lot of times people do come. They, they're just pow, 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 pow. And you're starting to pray for them. Where do I begin, okay? Trust Father to bring you to one or two points, okay? All of this, we can't unravel it. He can. He can touch every bit of it, okay? Uh, but you can still be effective in situations like this. Don't just back away from it. You just go in, you find, Father's gonna highlight something and you're gonna bring them to a place of peace in that area, victory in that one thing. Don't walk away thinking I failed them. No, 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 because they've got freedom they did not have, okay? And they've got a new beginning in their life, okay? Amen? All right, let's go back to our material. Page 61. So we're going to begin, usually, if you can, by just reminding that recipient who they are in Christ. We just want to speak that into them, okay? That's just going to open things up in their spirit and reminding them. And, the, and that faith that they already have is just going to come alive again. Oh, yes, this is who I am. I know this is who I am. So it doesn't have to be this exact prayer. You may only have two or three sentences. It doesn't matter. You just want to go that direction. Here's our, our example. Lord Jesus, I thank you that deliverance from every source of oppression or evil is part of your covenant with your children. I thank you that your desire for your children is that we are whole in our body, soul, and spirit. You have made us free. Thank you for freedom from all bondage, all lies. We access that promise right now by faith. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your desire to heal, cleanse, and deliver your child from all the power of the enemy. Amen. Amen. So that's kind of a good way to, to start. You're just setting the basis of faith there, pulling those promises. And what you're saying is so powerful. As you're going in, you're just putting medicine on those wounds. You're just dispersing the shame, taking that fear away. You're just going in and ministering with your words and just pulling that out, really, really, really getting into the heart of things. Now, uh, I included here this part it, early in the session that we should command if we need to and deal with any kind of manifestation that might be happening. Now, sometimes there might be a, a, a manifestation in the church service that you can deal with quickly, just like this. And you'll just kind of see if you can, all right? You're just going to see if you can. And here's a... An, a, a powerful prayer is exactly what Jesus is telling us to do. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of every unclean spirit. In the name of Jesus, I command every unclean spirit to leave now and never return, okay? So that's just a, a, a way to just get right to the point, get right to the point. Um, depending upon the manifestation, you're going to move forward. 
If there's a violent or vocal manifestation in the altar area, we're going to, we're just going to ease out of it. You're going to send for somebody, one of the executive staff, one of the other ministers that are here on Sunday nights, and you're just going to ease out of it. I can't tell you exactly how to do that in this classroom, okay? But you're just going to pray for them, and you're going to ease out of it. But people are watching. We're, we're attentive to these situations. When someone starts to become violent or vocal, somebody's coming your way, okay? Somebody's coming your way. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's going, it'll all work out just right. Um, we're going to wait with them as, as long as we need to while the Lord cleanses them. As long as they're making progress, you're good to go, all right? So just hang on. Don't get confused about what I just said, all right? As long as they're making progress, you're good to go, all right? So, um, and what we want to do, just like we do in several situ situations, is to lead them in a prayer that deals with what they're dealing with, okay, that's specific to their circumstances. And so we've included some samples here. These are, you do not have to memorize these prayers. These are to give you an idea of how you might verbalize that, okay? So this first one here at the bottom of 61 is if you're dealing with something in the spirit realm, in the spiritual realm. We talked about realms. So you're asking them, you're saying, repeat after me. One, I'm going to just pray for you one sentence at a time. Just repeat after me. And you'll lead them through a prayer. Lord, I repent of my sin. Let's say it's of rebellion. Lord, I repent of my sin of rebellion. They need to name the sin, all right? They need to name it. And I, rep I repent that through my rebellion, I gave the enemy access to my life. I denounce him and, I, and his influence in my life, and I surrender my life again to you. Thank you for helping me. So that's an example there. On page 62, top of page 62, we have an example for the physical realm. For the physical realm. Let's see. I beg your pardon. All right. Uh, Lord, I thank you that healing's in your covenant. I'm under a physical attack from the enemy. I know that this attack is not of you, and it does not belong to me. I ask in your name, Lord Jesus, that this sickness be destroyed. I break the influence of the enemy in my body, and I receive my healing by faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If nothing else, that one sentence is enough, okay? Because they're taking back their authority. It's their body. They have authority over it. They're taking back their authority and taking it away from the enemy by what they say, by what they say, all right? The next example we have there is for the mental realm. Lord, I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. Right now, by faith, I take every negative thought captive, and here's their declaration. I reject the enemy, and I will no longer give him place in my thoughts. I surrender my mind and my thoughts to you, Jesus, and ask you to feel my mind with your power. Thank you for delivering me from negative thoughts. And this is a good opportunity for you to help them have some clarity about the boundaries that are in place concerning the demonic and our thought processes, all right? And reminding them that the, that the demonic cannot read their thoughts, cannot read their mind. They have, and that their... Um, Power against us is always through intimidation or suggestions, just lies, and just pushing it at us to get us to listen to them and follow them. Remember, we talk about we're going to choose. If we have the power to choose to obey our Father, we certainly have the power to choose to obey or not to obey the enemy. If we did not have the power to resist him by refusing and rejecting the lies and the intimidations and the suggestions, Father would not have told us to do it. So we have that power, okay? And so you want to interject that as you need to do that to help somebody understand the enemy's not, he does not know what you're thinking. He does not know what you're thinking. He's looking for a response from you. Your response is to reject him and to refuse that lie that he's coming to you with, okay? They are... Um, willing to do anything. They will not hesitate to come against a child of God. But we have the authority and that power resident in us at our salvation to reject and to refuse and not to obey. We're not going to be drug off 
by our noses down the road that we are not supposed to go down just because we have a suggestion from the enemy, okay? The power is that you can hear him, okay? I, I made a statement that said, you've got your target. But what I mean by that is that when you can hear him, you know the source of the problem, okay? We know the source. Father's given us the ability to identify the source of our problem, okay? And we, we respond to that. It's not that we go chasing after them. We don't need to, okay? And as a matter of fact, they want you to, okay? They want that engagement. So we just need to reject them and refuse any suggestion being made. Okay, so if you you can help people with that, y'all can really help them, especially when you're when somebody's dealing with something that's going on in their mind, and and the Lord gives you the discernment that the enemy's poking around, that he's trying to pull them off track or has fed them a lie, and they're believing that lie. Okay, over the Word of God. All right, let's move on. Next paragraph is the emotional realm. Lord Jesus, I've given, I confess, I've given the enemy a foothold in my life. Let's just say it's through jealousy. I ask that you forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I repent and I reject the enemy in the name of Jesus. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. I confess that you are Lord of my life and I thank you for my deliverance. Uh, and then this last one, of course, is the emotional realm as well. Lord, I reject fear and anxiety. In the name of Jesus, I'll no longer allow the enemy to harass me this way. Your word says that your peace will guard my heart and mind. That's a promise. Your peace will guard my heart and mind. And right now, by faith, I receive your peace. I confess your Lord. I thank you and confess that fear must go in the name of Jesus. So you can just lead them through some really powerful prayers dealing with whatever that situation is that y'all have identified, okay? Again, we're dealing, uh, we're going to lead them one sentence at a time. You don't want them to have to try to figure out, oh gosh, what did she say or what did he say? We're going to just take our time, deal with the issue. The main thing is they're rejecting the lie, they're rejecting the enemy, placing the Lord back into full authority in their life, agreeing with their Father, agreeing with our Father again, reconnecting with Jesus in every way, is, um, it's going to a, a eliminate a lot of the issues that's going on because a lot of what the enemy does is to get him to follow off behind, get us to follow off behind him so that he can start leading our life, okay? So we want to get out of that line, get back in line with our Father, and walk with him, okay? So you can do that. You can help them with that. Some other uh, elements other ways to pray or, or things to remember when we're praying in uh, situations, ministering the word and deliverance is, uh, is listed here. I just want to touch on a few of them. Have the recipient repent of allowing the enemy an entrance and legal rights into their life. Have them verbally denounce and take back all legal rights that they gave to the enemy. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Have them verbally command the enemy to leave. They need to say this. They need to say it. So important. They need to say it out loud. Have them close all entryways that were open to the enemy. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, lead them in a prayer for Holy Spirit to fill them again. I'll, I'll, make, um, I'll go into that a little bit more in just a minute too. But you want all these things you want to keep in, keep in your arsenal and be ready to use if you need to, okay? It is, it, you can see what's needed based on the issue, based on the obstacle. At, and have them, lead them in a prayer, asking Holy Spirit to bring conviction and awareness of future demonic activity so that they can respond immediately. This is big, this is huge, this is so effective and powerful in the life of a believer that Holy Spirit would, would make us aware when the enemy's coming, or when we're just off track in our belief system, that, so that we can respond quickly, so we can get back on track quickly, very quickly. All right, so just a kind of a summary of what I just covered. I just put this together for you, um, just to kind of see how things might flow. Again, there might be some differences in the order, but this is kind of a thorough dealing with everything encapsulated process for us with, in ministry for deliverance. So we, we're going to discover what the problem is, 
be aware of what their relationship with Jesus is. We already have talked about that many, many times. Consider what realm is, is it in so that you'll know how to respond with which, what kind of a prayer, what kind of declaration that you will need to bring into the situation as an antidote. Um, explain what you, how you're going to minister to them if you have that opportunity. That's helpful to people, especially if they're new in church. What's happening to me? And then you can, you know, you can just kind of, you can tell when they're frightened and just say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lead you through a prayer and Father's going to touch you and he's going to help us. He's always helps you. Okay. And so you can just be very gentle, very helpful there. Again, we have our opening prayer, just declaring over them who they are, reminding them of their identity in Christ, uh, using commands for any unclean spirits to leave, taking authority over the situation, at the very least commanding it to be quiet and so that you could, and then you'll be able to minister, okay? Don't let the demonic get in and start messing with you, okay? We just don't have to. It's just not that big of a deal. All right. Then we're going to lead them in prayer, uh, repentance and cleansing. Uh, we're just, again, bringing back, agreeing with Father, just dealing with the reality that they're dealing with, verbally rejecting the enemy and the lie, and then reconnecting them to Jesus and the truth. And then, of course, we want to, as often as we can, end with um, asking Holy Spirit to fill them again with His Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we, of course, want to conclude with uh, thanksgiving and leading them in a, just a simple prayer for thank, thanking the Lord for their deliverance because that's an act of faith right there. That's kind of sealing things up right there. All right, let's go to page 71. Let's turn to page 71. This section, uh, I mentioned, you know, um, inner healing several times. When, um, not everyone needs inner healing, but when someone's been bound for years, they, their mind's been transformed to that condition, okay? Their whole life is just immersed in that setting, that being bound, believing lies, believing a lot of lies, okay, not knowing who they are. So there's some component, I, I believe, this is just me, I believe that there's some component of inner healing that's needed whenever deliverance is involved, okay? That that person needs to be transformed to the Word of God by the renewing of their mind. And sometimes the enemy can have such a hold in someone's, in someone's life, could be generational, could be their whole family, that they've got to learn how to live a different way, a whole entire different way, okay? Uh, there's a lot of family dynamics we talked about. There's no perfect family, but some things are extreme, and that's all a child might know, okay? So there might be some level of inner healing that, that needs to take place. That's not what this is about. I just wanted to interject that so that you can just keep that tucked in the back of your mind that that is likely part of their process that they're going to need. Now, this model here, this illustration here that we're using to, uh, to follow up with someone who's had some difficulties is based on Jesus' teaching. You see it there, Matthew 12, 43 through 45. I'll read it quickly. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So um, there's a lot to that, but what I want to just pull out of it is this is why we want to ask Holy Spirit to fill them, fill that person again with, their, with his spirit. We, we want to ask, lead them in a prayer asking Father, to fill them, fill their house, this house, fill their, all their spaces, uh, with, again, with his Holy Spirit, to bring, that, bring the power of God back into their life in full. Um, de and depending upon how much involvement they've been in with the demonic, that process may take some time, okay? Don't be afraid about that. Don't be afraid about that at all. But anyway, let's just cover this material in the time that we have left. 
because you want to be familiar with this so that you can help them, help this person that you just minister to, to stay free, okay, to stay free, all right? Um, you might want to say, you're free, you've been cleansed, you're forgiven, the Lord's going to help you, help you stay free, but you've got some responsibility in that. You're, you've got some part, a part that you have to play. You have to possess yourself and your life, okay? So we wanted to remind them the importance of them being actively involved in staying free. They have to really think about this in advance. They're going to prepare in advance to stay free, all right? So you might say, I'm just going to follow on through our text here. We're like a house. A house has passages of entry. When you open a door or a window or any other means of entry, something or someone can enter at will. So when we open things in the spirit realm, anything can enter at will, okay, if we're not careful. If a person opens an entryway, the enemy can legally come in or dominate that person's body or mind or establish chaos and establish chaos and destruction in their life. So in essence, we can, through sin, hand the enemy the keys to our world, to who we are, okay? So now they've taken those keys back, but they need to be aware and plan in advance to not give those keys away again. All right, so we're just using the metaphor of a house, thinking about our body, our spirit, our mind, that kind of things. Let's go on. You're the keeper of your own house. Uh, we are commanded in Ephesians 4.26. This is our instructions. Do not give place to the devil. Do not give place to the devil. We're warned in advance. Don't give any place to the devil. He's always looking for a way in so that he can attack. Jesus taught in John 10.10 10, um, that he only comes, that a thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Otherwise, they don't come. There's no use in it, okay? So there's a purpose for him to be there, to kill, to steal, and destroy every time. But we are responsible for opening and closing the entryways. He cannot influence us unless we permit the enemy to enter into our house or our world. Remember, he depends on legal access so that he can have the maximum effect. He depends on legal access so that he can have maximum effect. That, that legality that we use in our language, only you can give it to him. Only you, all right? You've got the authority to keep it, and you've got the authority to give it away, all right? So you're going to help people to hold on to what they, to their, their body, their mind, their spirit, everything. There are ways, so you might give them some examples. Last paragraph, there's ways that you can protect the entryways to your life. These are just simple examples here. The eyes are a primary gateway. Um, a person should be careful what they put before their eyes. That's just so simple. We just want to encourage people to turn away from everything that is not godly. Everything that's not godly, okay? And I want to speak to those of you who are training to minister to children or to youth. You know how hard it is for adults to keep things out from in front of their eyes. Well, the world is constantly bombarding our children and our youth with illicit material, demonic material, blatantly demonic material, violence that we cannot, adults cannot even bear it, and they're watching it on a daily basis. So be aware, of you're training to work with children to be ready to tell them, turn away from everything that's dark. They know what that means. Tell them to turn away from everything that starts. Listen to mommy and daddy. Do what mom and daddy tell you to do. And be sure not to watch things. You know, uh, the Harry Potter thing right now is such, it's been for years a fascination for children. It's such a, it's such a hook to pull them in. Children that never like to read, all of a sudden, they're just devouring these books, okay? And it's blatantly demonic. They're teaching children how to cast spells, okay? So you put that in light of the gospel. I mean, it's just horrible, the things that children are, are bombarded with. So just, you all be ready to bring that out into the light and to help the children to turn away from that, to be courageous enough 
to turn away from the things that they see going on around them and to know that they are, they are light in darkness. They can understand that. You are the light in this world. You don't have anything to do with all this darkness that's going on around you. All right, let's move on. Top of page 72. Another entryway is what we hear. So we want to be careful to what we're listening to. Any kind of negative conversation, unfavorable humor. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Workplace humor, mm-mm, no. Uh, and then any kind of foul language. Any kind of foul language, you just don't have it. We just don't have it in our, in, around us. That's just another entryway for the enemy because is God in it? Mm. He is not in it. So Jesus said, either you're with me or you're against me. So we, we've got to be careful about that. It speaks to our testimony as well. So you want to make sure that you take time to help a person see how the enemy may have gained access to their life or how they might have become even bound with the works of the flesh, okay? So take a little bit of time. Be ready to do that. And, of course, anything that comes against the Word of God, that challenges the Word of God. Also, we want to encourage them. This happens so frequently that they're... Their social life, their life structure, their friend communities, they're not, everybody's not saved. And so they might be young in the Lord. They might still be easily swayed into or find themselves in a situation they promised they'd never get in again. But here they are in the midst of all their friends. They don't want to give up their friends, blah, blah, blah. But we've got to tell people just out loud, black and white, you've got to get away from those people until they do not have an effect on you. There might be a time where you can be around the unsaved, and we're supposed to be around the unsaved, but we, but not we can't be coerced to sin. We've got to be careful about that. So for a time, you might need to tell somebody. And th again, this is just common sense. But for a time, if that's your problem, if you know that you're that you're easily led astray, or or find yourself in situations that you can't get out of, and all of a sudden you're doing what everybody else is doing, don't go in that situation. Okay, that's just easy. Um, now, we always want to, as I've said many times, we always want to be gentle, but especially when it comes to word or prayer ministry where someone has, has exhibited the inability to be free. You want to be gentle. You want to be encouraging, gracious, merciful, all those kinds of things, all that display all that so they, that we don't build on the shame that they already have. But you want to be firm. We want to be firm. We want to know what we know because their spiritual walk with the Lord could be at stake. Their life could be at stake, okay? So we want to be firm uh, in what we say. We want to be firm. We want to know what the Word of God says and how important it is that they, are, that they participate in remaining free, in remain, the freedom that Jesus has provided for them, that they participate and are actively involved in holding on to that freedom, okay? Um, again, we're going to deal with whatever we need to on a practical level. What, they might need an accountability partner. They might need to go to the doctor. You know, let's just say they're an alcoholic, but they want to be free from that. Well, there may be some life cycle things that, that needs to be dealt with. There may be some medical, some body situations that, that need to be dealt with. So don't negate the physical part. Don't leave out the physical, natural, common sense um, ideas that Father gives you. Don't discount that because it doesn't sound spiritual enough. If he tells you that they need counseling, be, you know, just go with where he's taking you on that, on that level, all right? But again, always, always finish by reminding them that the enemy cannot gain access or control unless they give it to him, okay? We'll remind people of that. We don't want to let them be, we don't want to leave them fearful, but we also want to be very honest about you've got control. That's part of your identity. It's part of your benefits in Christ is that you do not have to be led in any direction that you don't want to go. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to finish up. We're just uh, right here at the end of our 14 classes. Y'all are just incredible. Um, I just want to take us back kind of to where we began and just encourage you that we are all lifetime learners. We always will be. We will learn and we will relearn. 
and we'll forget some things and we'll go back and pick them up. Uh, Father will continue to build in you, even from these classes, from some of you are students here at Cana in our Caneo Ministry Training Center. Know that all these tools are coming your way and that he is going to bring to you those that need your help, particularly you. You'll have certain understanding that some of us won't. You will too, and you, all of you, because you come from different lifestyles, different understandings, different experiences, training. You have different levels of love and compassion, but you're all willing to minister the word well. And I, I just want you to remember that. You've made a commitment. You've positioned yourself for Father to push you beyond your boundaries of what you realize and who you are so that his, why? So that his power can rest upon you. And that's my prayer for every one of us so that we may minister well, so we may minister well. Well, let's read our job description, so to speak. This is where we begin. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for all of these, my friends, Lord, and the work that you are, um, that's taking place in all of us. Father, the understanding, the clarity, Lord, the power and the confidence that you place within us, only you can. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you that you are always present to help us, that your good will is toward all of your children, Lord, and toward the lost. Father, I pray that you would bring to our remembrance these tools, these practical tools, and these powerful, spiritual, eternal weapons that you've provided for your children. Bring them back to our remembrance as we need them. We know that they're always available. We thank you, and we love you more and more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.